this retreat is a special retreat for me because it's the first one I've I've uh, led where I've had uh, all this help from other members of the Sangha and uh, usually I'm a selfish teacher I want to do it all <laughs> this time I'm I've decided to share these opportunities, especially now that the, the Sangha is maturing and that what they have to say is uh, worth listening to. Uh, living in in Europe for 13 years, one is, uh, I feel very pleased actually with the result because it was an unknown situation when I went there. Uh, there had never been anything, ever any attempt to do what we've done in a Western country before. There was no kind of real precedent for it uh, and it was all a heap of unknowns, uh, so that over the past 13 years it's developed in a way that that one was well, more than one really expected, both on the material level of, of acquiring very nice places to live in, which seemingly just seemed to come to us when we we had to live in London for two years. Uh, and that was a really a trying period because we were forest bhikkhus and we most of us became monks uh, in order to get out of the cities and live a quiet life with nature and so the last thing any of us wanted to do was live in London which is a fairly nice city but it's still hectic enough modern uh, busy city And during that time, we, we, we speculated about getting, moving out, uh, trying to move out of London uh, into the countryside, but we didn't quite know where to go. So we'd have meetings where we'd decide, well, where? We didn't have any money either. So we, <laughs> we, uh, we could sell the, the house in London and use that money to, to purchase a property in the country. But buying and selling property in England is is one of the most tedious procedures I've ever experienced in my life and uh, something I don't look forward to ever having to go through again. I don't know what it's like in this country but there's a whole process of of having to sell and then promise to buy and before you you have the money to pay for the, your new property you have to be sure that somebody's going to buy your old property and then people would back out at the last minute and all, all these kind of things were going on. And so we, <clears throat> we thought, where did they have property that is within reason? Because, say, many parts around England are very expensive, especially the closer you are to London. So we thought, Wales. I like the idea of living in Wales. So we spent a lot of time looking in Wales and uh, came up with some very nice situations, but every attempt to try to sell our property in London didn't quite coincide with buying the property in Wales. And after three or four attempts at doing this, it all uh, didn't seem to work out. So, so then we, th we found another place in Somerset, beautiful uh, a kind of old house with right, bordering right on Dartmoor, so you could you could not only have your own property, but you could walk out into this kind of national park. Perfect spot. And then the same thing happened. We, by the time we could get into the process of selling our property in London, a, a wealthy Frenchman flew over from Paris, bought the, bought the place up right under our nose after the <laughs> owner promised not to sell it to anyone. 
another disappointment. So then, by this time, I was I was thinking, you know, it's a pretty hopeless situation, uh, and uh, and the one area we never thought of looking in and never considered as a possible place to start a monastery was in West Sussex, uh, because that is a, one of the most expensive <laughs> areas of, of England. It's a very beautiful uh, area and with all kinds of preservation orders and, and prohibitions to build and, and uh, everything is, uh, was, we thought was beyond our ability to, to pay for any, any kind of property there. But then, in our one day, we met this man on on Hampstead Heath, a jogger, who in in the, uh, who ended up giving his his forest to us, 108 acres of woodland in West Sussex. <laughs> so West Sussex was fated to receive us, and then following that, we didn't have any place if we. Uh, the forest was, didn't have any accommodation. So then we had to look for houses around nearby that were for sale. Uh, and fortunately, there was this old derelict house with these very eccentric owners. Uh, that they had this, it was a Victorian, early Victorian <coughs> mansion. And it was uh, in a state of uh, horrible decay, uh, dry rot, riddled with dry rot, and generally a most dismal looking house, but in a very beautiful setting. And I remember going there the first day to look at it, and, and it was just like something now, a kind of Dickensian scene, where the, you go into the, it was a rainy day, and we went in, there's this muddy road, because the people that owned the place had, hadn't done anything to repair it in, in 30 years. And so it's uh, the road, the the state of the house. If it, the floor in one of the, in one side of it had fallen into the cellar, <laughs> and anyway, we we managed to get to the house through the mud mud puddles on the road, and and we knew the owners were a bit eccentric, and we, they opened, the, they let us in the house, and there the hallway was filled with with newspapers, stacks of, they were hoarders, they, they never let anything go. And so, for 30 years, anything that went inside that house never left it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, then I remember we were invited in to the one livable room, a kind of living room they had. There was no heating in the place. <coughs> the heating system had packed up, and. That they had this little fire burning in the fireplace, and the, this man and his wife and his rather sickly-looking daughter of about 20 years old, and the, the wife was sitting there knitting and uh, <laughs> a, around this fire, trying to keep warm, and the room was just a clutter of things with stacks of magazines and, and every possible thing, dust and... and it's the accumulation of years of never, never uh, cleaning up or taking anything away. But these people were quite uh, honorable people, actually, and they, they really liked the idea of their house becoming a Buddhist monastery. <laughs> so they were Roman Catholics, and they, had, they thought they liked m m the idea of monasteries. And it didn't seem to matter whether it was... <laughs> <laughs> So they, they agreed to sell the house, and uh, then the, uh, we had to sell our house in London, and that finally went through. We sold, it, we sold our house in London for exactly what we had to pay for the house in West Sussex. It was a, just an even. And so we didn't have any money. <laughs> we, had, we just changed. Uh, a fairly livable house in London, <laughs> or, or a derelict dump in West Sussex. So. 
But over the years, that was uh, once we moved out of London and into Chithurst House, uh, something took off. Something wonderful happened, and and uh, it, we we managed to live in this uh, decaying place and repair it, and and everything seemed to fall into place and go very well. Uh, eventually, the district council and the neighbors and everyone became quite friendly and helpful. And this was this was all quite a surprise because in conservative neighborhood, I hear in the United States it's probably even worse than in England, uh, peop conservative people don't want weirdos walking around their <laughs> the countryside or their neighborhoods. And we're definitely weirdos <laughs> in the in context of West Sussex which is a retirement area for kind of ex-colonial officers and, and, <laughs> and ex retired generals and brigadiers and people like that. Now living, forming a community, at that time the increasing amount of monks coming from, Western monks coming from Thailand to join me, and then uh, Sister Sundra came, and there were three other women all wanting to help, and, and so there was a, suddenly a, and they wanted to have more of a commitment to the community, like become uh, members of a community as, as nuns, and so this was something I'd never done before in my life, and, and uh, I, uh, so I, I agreed to do this. But now you can see after what, uh, that was 13 years ago, or 10 years ago, just in a, in a short decade, uh, a good result. People have, have actually worked through innumerable personal conflicts and problems to, to begin to appreciate Dhamma and to live in that way, live according to Dhamma. Now when a community lives in harmony with Dhamma, there's, there are no problems. The problems arise in community life when we don't live according to Dhamma, when we live according to our desires, and then there's no end to the problems that we create. That doesn't mean our community doesn't have problems, because our e egos manage to, to e interfere now, uh, now and then, and then also new members of the community and lay people and just the, the ways of the world do affect. Uh, us in sometimes in very wonderful ways and sometimes in very annoying ways. But the practice of Dhamma allows us always to keep perspective and not to, not to panic, not to become hysterical or worried about the threatening situations that might arise uh, in daily life. Now, communities, they a community is a group of individuals, and Western people are are we're conditioned to to cling to the idea of being individual and separate. Uh, in America, here, I, having been born and raised on the West Coast, uh, and coming from a time where individualism was was the word of the day, to be an individual was was the way to be, and conformity was definitely despised. And I remember when I was a young university student reading a, a book by Alberto Moravia called The Conformist, and I think, I'll never become one of those. <laughs> and then I read uh, Colin Wilson's The Outsider, and I read uh, Siddhartha, Hermann Hesse, and, and all these different that was emphasize my individuality and my, my uniqueness. I wanted to be a unique character uh, and express myself as a unique individual character, a special being. The, the thing that most horrified me was ending up being just a nobody, a kind of blind uh, conformist to middle-class American life the way my parents wanted me to be. 
get a job, get married, get a job, and settle down, which was something I was not going to do. <laughs> so I had uh, that kind of rebellious streak in me and a real strong desire to, to experiment with life and to, to, uh, to really, uh, and, and, and wanting, and f feeling that I should become increasingly more individual and eccentric and unique. But then as you get older, that, that way of behavior becomes tiresome. I mean, an aging hippie or a, a, an old beatnik <laughs> is a rather pathetic creature. <laughs> and when I lived in Berkeley, I began to see that because in graduate school, I was, I was still maintaining my eccentricities, uh, but I began to feel a bit silly about it, and I began to notice uh, other kind of aging people that still were trying to be like that. And so I thought, and this is, and this is, and I find myself, I found myself feeling increasingly lonely. Uh, even though I, I had no shortage of friends or social opportunities at that time, uh, my ability to relate with others was, was definitely limited. There were so many blocks and fears uh, and the determination to, to cling to this idea of independence, self-sufficiency and uniqueness. I, the result of that made me feel increasingly more lonely. So I was in, in graduate school and I was in my late twenties. And uh, at that time I remember looking out the kitchen window one day while I was washing the dishes into the back garden and I saw this dog out in the garden and I thought, oh, even that dog is more fortunate than I am. <laughs> I began to feel so lonely that even a dog seemed to be a better birth than, than being me. <laughs> so the result of, of this, of my immaturity and my clinging and my emphasis on my uniqueness and my, my separateness, the result was, uh, I could see, was a, just an increasing sense of alienation from others. Even so-called friends or close friends uh, I felt alienated from. There didn't seem to be any way possible to kind of feel uh, any real closeness or, or unity with anybody. And I didn't know why, even though that was an ideal in my mind. But the, the conditioned mind was so was so stuck into these, these ideas, these, these habits of, of emphasizing my, my uniqueness, my separateness, that I found even, even in, in marriage a, a total inability to, to really be married to anyone because it was, there were two unique, separate individuals living together. It was about all that happened. So, then the tendency to see this as a, as a personal flaw, like a neurotic problem, because uh, in those days, in the early 60s, we were reading Eric Fromm and, and, and all these uh, books about how important it is to, to have fulfill, sexual fulfillment and uh, how this was the kind of raison d'etre of our existence to, to be sexually fulfilled all the time and to, uh, and to analyze ourselves. And if, if we weren't being fulfilled all the time this way, then there's something wrong. So this was a constant worry in the mind because somehow this, this was increasingly uh, less meaningful and even alienating. Uh, and the more one tried to feel fulfilled and let the more, the more alienated one felt. 
and and so it was becoming a one felt that, that there was no hope. Uh, there became a, a general feeling of of uh, hopelessness and depression. Well, at that time, I, I when I finished the the uh, master's degree, I immediately volunteered for the Peace Corps just to get me off to Asia because my dream was to go and live in Asia. And, uh, and this was an invitation by President Kennedy uh, in which they'd pay my way across the ocean and <laughs> I'd get to live uh, uh, in, in a fairly nice way as a, as a volunteer doing something quite interesting. So I was sent off to, uh, to uh, Saba, which is, uh, then was uh, North Borneo. Then the development, seeing the, the mind already aware of the dukkha of existence, and, and I reached my 30th year in Borneo, and 30, age 30 is a, is a, has an impact. I think on the mind, because uh, at least it did on my mind, because it was obvious that youth was uh, definitely over. There was thirties did not never had my perception seemed to be youth filled, so I thought my youth is now gone, and where am I? Which made me consider what to do next. And, and that led me to Thailand and to a life of strict conformity as a Buddhist monk. Because I even chose the monastery that was the most conf- demanded the most amount of conformity. There were monasteries I could have gone to that would have let me get away with being eccentric and unique. Because in the Thai scene I was. I was a, uh, what they call a prop farang. Uh, uh, farang is their word for foreigner. And uh, I was a, and pra is, a, is their word for venerable. So I was a, a venerable farang or a venerable foreigner wherever I went. And I was, uh, a, I always was a, put them, in, in, people were interested in and awestruck when they saw such a big <coughs> farang. <laughs> <laughs> because Thai people are not very tall, you see, and, and I stood out, actually. <laughs> so I could have set myself up in following my own desires and wishes, but there, there was a recognition, that was the last thing I needed to do, that, that I would be wasting my time as a monk if I just manipulated life from my own ends. What I wanted to do was to put myself in a very conforming situation of obedience. I needed to learn how to obey somebody above me because I had rebelled for too many years and had, had uh, maintained this idea of independence uh, uh, as, as my ideal. And of course, I resented authority. I, I hated and feared people above me or who had any authority over my life. I found a, a real fear, resentment towards anyone who would assume that role toward me. So in choosing to go to Ajahn Chah's monastery, I, I was aware of my own problem and I wanted to see what would happen, what I would do under such a situation. So then, for the next ten years, when I went to Ajahn Chah, he said, uh, I advise you to stay here five years. And I thought to myself, no way can I stay here five years. <laughs> because uh, it wasn't the part of Thailand I wanted to live in. I mean, I, I've been a West Coast American, I've, and I was in the Navy for four years, I like the sea coasts and I like water and I like the ocean. So I dreamed of my life as a monk living on the Gulf of Thailand in some uh, sandy beach with palm trees. 
and uh, there's a lot of places like that that one can go to in Thailand, lovely monasteries on the sea coast. And I kind of pictured myself in one of these, living uh, a peaceful, serene life, uh, listening to the sound of the, the waves and the tide coming in. And so, but then I found myself in Ubon Rajatani, which is probably one of the least attractive places in Thailand. And it's, it's inland, and it's a flat plain uh, with scrubby woodland, scrubby forests. Uh, and my first impression, I, I heard about it before I even went there. I was teaching English in Bangkok and, uh, at this language school, and there was an American airman who was also teaching there, and he was telling somebody, I was overhearing this conversation, that he had just come from Uborn. He said, they're so poor in Uborn that the people have to eat insects for their meals. And I thought, oh, how dreadful. <laughs> that's, that's the last place I ever want to go to. <laughs> I'm just warning you about these statements we make. <laughs> Be careful what you say or think. So, Instead of the last place I wanted to go, I, I would go to it was about the first place I went to, or the second place actually, but it certainly wasn't the last place. Now I went there because uh, the, the monk that ordained me wanted me to go and live, stay with Ajahn Chah, who was a highly respected meditation master and, and very respected, is a bhikkhu, a monk that lived very much uh, under the Vinaya discipline, and oftentimes this discipline is, is not kept very strictly in a lot of monasteries in Thailand, uh, but in, in uh, Wat Pa Pong was very strict and you had to live very much within the limits of, uh, of the dis monastic discipline and train within that, those limits. And that, something in me knew that that's what I needed to do even though one part of me didn't want to do it, I'd rather run off to the sea coast and find a, a really nice place to listen to the tide coming in and watch the moon over the sea at night. But instead I spent almost ten years in Ubon Rajatani uh, and I found out that they have other things to eat besides insects. <laughs> But they do eat insects and, and everything else. So, <laughs> so, so I became quite adaptable in my uh, dietary habits. <laughs> Find when you're depending on alms food, you go with your alms bowl, and then whatever people put in it, which can be some of these morsels that that we find quite strange. But insects are, are vitamin-rich. <laughs> they're quite nourishing. Eh? And frogs. And now the life of a, of a monk is a reflective life, so you're always, you're, you're always watching yourself. And so living in, in, in Wat Pa Pong at first, uh, uh, I, at first I was very suspicious of it. I was critical. I went there uh, feeling quite, I didn't like Uban Rajatani very much, and I, and I was very suspicious of discipline and teachers and tended to be, tended to be more on the critical side than, on, than tending towards devotion and faith. So my mind tended to look around, see what was wrong with the place. Uh, and uh, Ajahn Chah was very skillful at that time, even though uh, we didn't have a common language, there was a, a translator for a brief period. But he also had a great heart and something that, the reason why I stayed in such a place was 
I, I couldn't figure it out. I said, why am I here? Why have I stayed here? Because I lived there instead of five years, ten years. And it wasn't all that intentional, it just happened that way. And one began to realize that just the power of a wise person was a very compelling and uh, compelling magnetic power. That Ajahn Chah had, had what you might say, charisma, in the, which is a, probably an overused word these days. Uh, he definitely had charm, and he's definitely wise. So uh, I began to realize that I had really discovered somebody that was was uh, very, very uh, that could really help me, and that uh, I should give myself to this place because uh, I'd never met anyone that impressed me like that. I'd, I'd been to see many teachers and different monks before going there, but I never felt that with any other, even though many of them were very wise, very famous. There was, there was something in the chemistry or in the karma or what, whatever way you want to look at it that, that uh, drew me to uh, Lung Pa Cha. And one thing was he was a very happy human being. And yet he lived within this discipline. He, he, was, he's, he lived within the Vinaya discipline and he'd been living that way for 40 years or so. So he, and yet there was this joyous spontaneity. Uh, he, was, he was obviously a very happy human being. And this happiness was contagious because he had a very well-developed sense of humor so that, that he could make everything uh, uh, quite humorous for us. We, it, one, way, one skillful way of teaching us was to get us to laugh at ourselves. Because sometimes Westerners, we take ourselves very seriously. And when you're trying to, too hard and, 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 and discipline can be really dead serious stuff. <laughs> discipline, rules, and uh, pure ideals of purity, pure rule, keeping, the, keeping your purity, and, and all of this is, can get really heavy and serious. So, and yet, Ajahn Chah had the ability to, to uh, bring humor into the life of a bhikkhu. So instead of becoming a kind of a dead serious, heavy existence where you're trying to get rid of your defilements and get enlightened, like this was, this was how my mind tended to work, because you've know, got to purify yourself and get enlightened, you've got, and these tendencies towards asceticism of, of kind of self-torture or, or proving yourself that, you're, that you can take it, that you're tough and that you can endure things. Uh, I think men have a problem with this, this attitude. So, so we, I, whenever I would get into these these uh, kind of moods, Ajahn Chah would always come up with some joke <laughs> in which it wasn't, it was, and it was oftentimes in public. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes I felt I was being made fun of. But one thing you had to say was well, that it was funny. <laughs> So I began to, to laugh at myself. I could, <laughs> I could see uh, kind of uh, the seriousness and the and my, taking myself so seriously was really quite humorous to Ajahn Chah because he wasn't taking me very seriously. <laughs> but that didn't mean that, that, there was, that it, it was frivolous or, or, uh, or foolish because the humor was, was a definite necessity in meditation because I've noticed people that oftentimes lose their humor in meditation. <laughs> uh, they tend to uh, be trying so hard that, that, and taking themselves so seriously that it becomes an onerous burden, a kind of sterilizing 
technique and emotional sterility occurs. I found this in, say, after so many years of meditation as a monk, a kind of, of emotional sterility taking place where, where I wasn't wasn't particularly uh, unhappy, nor was I happy at all. Uh, and I thought, this, is, this must... I wonder if this is nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, because it's certainly the middle way between happiness and suffering. <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, liberation, and it wasn't... Uh, j- there was no joy in it. It was more or less... A, a dreary mental state. Putting oneself under discipline then involved strict conformity. So just as I was uh, obsessed with individuality before, I became an obsessed conformist. <laughs> and so I, I, I really tried to be a strict stricter than anyone else. Uh, I, I really was, was very much attached to the idea of, of strictness and, and serious practice and hard work. So that uh, these, these kind of images were... were I, would, I would throw myself into, into the opposite extreme, where I would feel very angry with any monk that showed any kind of eccentricity. <laughs> or or uh, un, unordinary behavior, or if they weren't on time, if they weren't in the, in the proper lineup, if things weren't done properly, if things weren't uh, done in the right way, if, if there was any laxity or looseness, then my critical faculties would take over and I would start hating those people who were not conforming, not on time, not obeying, not being good monks, not keeping the rules strictly. <coughs> they were weak and lax. They were worthless monks. <laughs> so you become like the Grand Inquisitor. <laughs> <laughs> but this is also suffering, to be, to be uh, a, a blind conformist. Is it being a blind Hedonist or blind conformist, blindness is suffering. This is metaphorical blindness. <laughs> now, one way that uh, Ajahn Chah would not really say much overtly, but it was through, uh, through humor and innuendo and also through example. It's the way he lived. That one began to see that even though he was, one could call him a strict monk, there, was, there didn't seem to be any strictness. Like there was no tenseness. There was no, he didn't seem to be upset by eccentricity or oddities. He seemed to even find them uh, interesting. And uh, he uh, seemed to be able to adapt and role with the flow of life, and still one could say he was a very strict monk in, in terms of keeping within the restraint, but there was not, there was no kind of tension in it. And so seeing that, one began to say, why do I, why does this, this kind of life make me very tense? And why do I, I used to be much more liberal and kind and, and generous person when I was a hedonist. But now I'm a I'm a strict vinya bhikkhu, and I, you know, I'm really upset by any tiny infringement, and and I become very narrow-minded and harsh and judgmental towards everyone. So why I was I was a lot nicer as a person when I was a a, a liberal degenerating hedonist. <laughs> Then I am when I am when I am a strict conformist. Why is this? Surely the Buddha didn't mean this. This was the way to liberation. So, 
because of the suffering, then you, you contemplate that. Why, why am I suffering from this? I'm keeping all the rules and uh, I'm, I'm, I work hard, I practice all the time and so forth. I'm doing all this. And like Venerable Amro said so well the other night, but there is still me being a strict monk. There is still this, there is still the, the sense of self and uh, the individuality had merely uh, connected on monastic life, and, and it, the, but it was still coming from a sense that it's me doing it, and I am this, this uh, very good monk, very strict monk, who keeps the rules. Now, reflecting on the results of your practice, you can then begin to see what, what it is that you're doing, what, what you're attached to. Like when, when talking to you, 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 know, you, you want to know like what to do or what, what you should practice. And, and uh, there's all kinds of questions about uh, you know, how to practice and develop uh, and techniques and and attitudes, but the uh, in this retreat, I'm really trying to emphasize the need to reflect on the results of what you're doing, because much of the time we we do things uh, as a kind of compulsion. Uh, the teacher said that we should do this, and therefore we do it. We're obedient. We conform to what the teacher says, and we're we're being good boys and girls and obedient, but we're not really reflecting on what we're doing. We think that maybe we're still coming from the place that I'm a good student of, of Ajahn Sumedho because I'm doing what he says, or I'm, I'm a good disciple of this uh, teacher because I'm obedient and I do everything he says, tells me to do. But that, that might be building some kind of virtuous uh, qualities in your life, such as obedience and loyalty, but it's not liberating because we, we really need to exercise the mind to, to develop this reflective capacity because this is what libera where liberation lies, in being able to see the way it is rather than believing that by obeying all the rules we will become purified and therefore become enlightened. So there's this, one of the obstacles to seeing the path is this blind conformity or believing that by keeping all the rules and doing all the ceremonies and doing all the procedures and the techniques and doing them all properly that we will, some, that will somehow bring us someday to the state of enlightenment. And so you meet people like one one time in England, a man came to me, an elderly man, and was, was in great despair. And he said, Arjun Sumedho, I've been practicing 20 years and I've gotten nowhere. About, about ready to cry. And so I said, what, what have you been doing for 20 years? And, and he learned this te meditation technique that he'd been doing. He said, I do it every day for 20 years. I've never, never without fail. I do this technique. And he said, I'm nowhere. I haven't gotten anywhere with it. So then I said, but you, have you reflected on the results of using this technique? And, and he had this kind of faith in the teacher that gave him the technique. And, and, I, and sometimes, you know, without intending to, one can imply that the technique is the way to enlightenment. So, one can't blame the teacher, but sometimes that's how people hear it. And so he was very loyally, faithfully, doing this technique for 20 years, only feeling a total sense of failure with it. And he'd never seen, never, never thought of reflecting on the results of doing it. Just like, like uh, if, if, you, if a technique that you're doing 
what is the result of it? Then you can see if it tranquilizes the mind, if it, if it uh, makes you, if you, the way you do it tends to make you dull or brighten you up, or you can learn from just observing the results. And then by reflecting on the results, then it gives you insight into how to, to say, train in ways that, say, clear, clarify the mind, because the, the main purpose is enlightenment, to clear the mind from the obstacles that, that block it, to see clearly the way things are. Now, the, the, the mind tends to think of enlightenment maybe as a very exalted state, because the way it's pictured, like the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree, and the kind of legendary story of the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree and, and uh, sitting there, and suddenly this enlightenment, and, and one almost imagines a kind of electric charge and a kind of blazing light. Suddenly he's just sitting there, and then this, this kind of blazing light, wham, and I'm enlightened. <laughs> I understand everything. <laughs> so, when we, when we don't contemplate what we mean by enlightenment, sometimes these kind of childish images are affecting our perception. So we, we tend to be waiting for the big bang or the great blaze of light, and it doesn't come. So I've been doing this technique, and they said you get enlightened through doing this technique, and I've done it, and I'm not enlightened. What's wrong with me? Now, enlightenment, and try to look at enlightenment as not as blinding light. Some, like light can, can be so strong that it blinds you, and, all, and so you can't see anything. But if the light is right, then you can see clearly. And this is how I, how I like to view enlightenment. It's the amount of light to see clearly the way things are. Like in this room, if the, right, if the light is right, then we can see everything in this room properly. But if there's too much light, it, we're blinded by it, we have to close our eyes. Or if there's not enough light, we can only see the shadows of things. We can't see everything very clearly. We can get kind of just images and vague shadows. It's the best we can hope for in a dim light. And when there's no light at all, it's just black. We can't see anything. So enlightenment, then I see as wisdom. Using wisdom brings light, the amount of light to see clearly. And this is what we call here and now Dhamma. It's, uh, it's not, not coming from the idea that we have to become wise through doing a technique that will make us wise, but by using wisdom with a technique, using uh, sati, mindfulness and wisdom, sati and panya, mindfulness and wisdom, with the, the teacher we, we incline to, with the technique we use, with the way we meditate, with our, the way we are as individual beings. So enlightenment is really an ongoing thing. It's not it's not to be considered something that happens once and then you're transformed into, into a super being for the rest of your life. More and more you see, you know how to use the light to see clearly. And this is, this is what we call developing the path, in, in the Eightfold Path. When there's right understanding, then there's the, there's the beginning to see clearly. It's not that you see everything clearly and you know everything about everything, but it means that we're beginning to get glimmers through using wisdom, we're beginning to have momentary insights or understandings of things that before we didn't understand at all. And as we use wisdom more and more, then there's more light on everything, more seeing clearly. Light is, is, is the way it is. Enlightenment is and darkness is, is, the, is when we attach to the dark realms of greed, hatred, and delusion. When we're identified with our greed and our hatreds and delusions, then we're entering the dark realm. 
And that's the dim realm of shadows and ghosts and fears and desires and worries and obsessions and, and all the, the selfishness of the human heart lives in the realm of shadows and death and ghosts and, and specters and phantoms. So in order to, to turn the light on, switch on the light, it's a matter of, of doing it, not of, of, of uh, trying to uh, think that we have to go somewhere to switch on the light, because the light is the here and now Dhamma, the wisdom of being here and now, even when it's dark. To be able to know that it's dark is a reflection, that's an enlightened reflection. To be able to see the dark as an object is an enlightened reflection. The, there's light seeing the dark. Where if, you, if you're just trying to get rid of the dark by trying to put light into it, then you, you, you create illusory lights into it, but you're not really seeing it for what it is. You're, there's, you're, there's not enlightenment, there's merely creating uh, illusions of light into the darkness, which are, which is still uh, a state of delusion. So the way of turning on the light, switching on the light, is by seeing the darkness as is. Now in, tonight, when you go to your rooms and you you go to bed, switch off the light and just look at the darkness. And is that which sees the darkness, is that dark? Ask yourself. When you can't see anything with your eyes, but there's still the awakened mind seeing the darkness. And that is that dark? Or is that light? So we're looking at light as wisdom and knowing rather than as, as an electric light or a candlelight. So, in practicing meditation in the right way, you are being enlightened more and more. You're seeing things as they are. Even when you feel like in total despair that you've wasted 20 years of your life and haven't gotten anything, that, that one can see that that is an object of the, the, the light in the mind can see that despair. So the light you're switching on the light, you're using the light to see despair. It's like that. Despair is just that way. It's no longer my despair and my problem and I've wasted my life and I've gotten, haven't gotten anywhere, that kind of thing, but there's the knowing of that as an object, as a condition. And that's the light of wisdom that's seeing directly the way it is. Because that's what it is, isn't it? If you feel, I've wasted my life, and then you see that with wisdom, you're not, you're not trying to pretend you haven't wasted your life, <laughs> and you're not trying to convince yourself that you have or you haven't. You're just seeing that that particular feeling or mood <coughs> is an object, because that's what it is. Because the light that see, that with the light on, then you see it, and it's the not. It's merely like the, this clock or, or this carpet. It's not, <coughs> the reason why I know I'm not this clock is because it's an object to me. The reason why I know I'm not this carpet, because I see it as an object. If I, if I, if, wouldn't you think I was a bit crazy if I went around saying I'm a carpet? Well, that's what we do, isn't it? We say <laughs> <laughs> uh, so everybody's crazy, aren't they? You're crazy till you're enlightened, till you see in the light. Because you you go around saying, I'm I'm this this person. And to me that's as crazy as saying I'm the carpet. So you know what I think of you now. <laughs> <laughs> so 
with meditation we come to it for different reasons. Some, uh, some for very religious reasons. Some have strong spiritual uh, aspirations. Other people are, are more concerned with themselves, wanting to work out their problems. Or There are many different... Uh, I mean, we each have our own unique reasons or attractions to Buddhist meditation. But one thing that I try more and more to emphasize with people is trying to bring into your consciousness the, the complete, the full ability of a human being to be enlightened, to be free from all delusion. That this is, this is not just a, a nice Buddhist theory, but it is the, the right and the opportunity of all human beings. People will out in, in Britain sometimes a woman wants to be, can women get enlightened? Because they see it mostly this strong male presence, these bhikkhus. And so they say, can women get enlightened? And then can men get enlightened? I should say, can men get enlightened? <laughs> but this, being a man or woman is not an enlightened state. It's only when you see this as an object, that there's, then the light is on, there's the wisdom seeing the object, that I am a man, I'm a woman, is an object, then that's, that's, the, that's the enlightened mind, so that's the Buddha seeing the Dhamma. Many of you have doubts about yourselves, about what you've done in the past. Uh, maybe you haven't lived very skillfully, or you've been on drugs, or drink, or... And so these, these kind of memories create a lot of self-doubt about your abilities to get enlightened. Because we think, maybe, maybe I damaged myself, or maybe I, I've, did, I've done such foolish things that there's no possibility of being enlightened because uh, I haven't... Uh, I haven't uh, done all the right things for it. And, uh, but I want to, to uh, emphasize again that, that that is another doubt in the mind. If you can turn the light on, you can see it as just a doubt in your mind about I'm someone who, who did something, uh, probably ruined my life, and I'll never ever be able to, to get enlightened because of it. If you see that as an object, then that is seen in the light. You're seeing it as it is. It's an object. You're not, you're not believing it. You're not attaching to it. You're not suppressing it. You're not just dismissing it and saying, oh, of course I can get enlightened. Ajahn Sumedho said anyone can get enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> because that's, that's just convincing you. That's still ego, isn't it? And it's still uh, trying to convince yourself you're all right. But that's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to convince ourselves we're all right. But we're seeing that that, that, that kind of feeling is an object. I, I'm all right is an object of the mind rather than a self. Then it's all right. Investigate just the, the I am's of your life, really. This, this is an insidious uh, kind of, of conditioning we have of, of me and mine, I am. And of course the more, in, in the Western world, where we, we, uh, we emphasize me uh, above everyone else, I'm first. In Asia, at least, you, you people tend to put their families before themselves. My old Thai system, the uh, individual members of the family tended to to put the family first and themselves after. But modern Western people tend to put themselves first. The families are, don't matter at all. So we, we have a, the family breakdown, isn't it? We don't, we don't have... It's hard to keep a family together anymore in countries like this because I'm first. And that means that then you know where you, you are in relationship to me. So, 
so that we uh, are in a marriage. If, if the husband puts himself first, then, then that means that, uh, that uh, it's impossible to have a real marriage. You can't be married if, you're, if you have to be first. Because a marriage means you put the other one first, doesn't it? You put the other one first, not yourself. A family, a family has to be first and then me second. In the Sangha, it's the same way. It's the Sangha first and then oneself is, is after that. We're putting the Sangha first in our minds as, the, as the, what we respect and what we protect and what we uh, love and take refuge in rather than me first. So this, this is important, just to, to get a perspective on me and mine, how, how this, uh, I'm a unique individual character. Uh, I'm not going to be a blind conformist. Uh, I'm going to, to uh, live my life as I want to. And, uh, and how it affects anyone else is, doesn't matter because, because it's my life and I can do what I want with it. And so that, that's the me first. But then that's the way to loneliness, alienation. That's a lonely, it ends up with loneliness and, uh, and fear. As you turn on the light more and more, then this selfishness looks so, so uh, horrible that we, we, we don't want to be that way when you see it. For example, I, uh, I remember uh, going through all kinds of food uh, problems in Thailand because uh, the f the, it's a very communist system, these monasteries. Everything is shared. They try to share everything equally. And so they divide the food up and every day we'd have to, maybe you have 50 monks and you've got to to, to, and you have this amount of food, and you've got to try to, to uh, pass it out evenly. And, so, and you find yourself, especially uh, if you're one of these people, you, you find uh, yourself um, you know, really concerned sometimes about uh, what you're getting in your bowl, because you can't watch it. You have, you're out passing out the food, and people are putting things in your bowl that you have to eat. And if you're sitting there, sometimes you, you, you don't, you can say, if you don't particularly want what they're passing out, you can, you can go. <laughs> and then, if you're sitting there, then you can also say, because if they just dump it in your bowl, then it, it kind of mixes up in there, and it, it gets not very nice. So, you see monks sitting, sitting there, and the monks are passing out the food and they, they point it inside the bowl, put it over there. <laughs> so, <laughs> food brings up a very interesting mental state. So. I remember uh, trying to be a strict vegetarian one year. I asked Ajahn Chah if I could be a strict vegetarian. And Thai, Thai monasteries are seldom, if ever, vegetarian. You see, and they, people always put this kind of fish sauce, it's a salty sauce in, in almost everything. And to be a really strict vegetarian is very difficult. So, but I wanted to be a really strict one. <laughs> so, because I was tired of eating these insects. And, you know. <laughs> that was one way of getting out of it. And not having to admit that that was one of the reasons. Elevating it to a, a more a higher level of not wanting to be responsible for the loss of life. <laughs> but then I became obsessed with, with it. When somebody might put something in my bowl that might have fish sauce in it, I'd, I'd get really upset. And uh, in one monastery I was staying in, I, I was, I'd help pass out the food and they'd have these various dishes that were trustworthy vegetarian dishes and when, I, when they'd bring these dishes in to pass out, I'd run for them, try to get them first, so that I could make sure that I got plenty of this vegetarian food. 
because I was the only vegetarian in the monastery. So I was becoming obsessed with, with keeping, this, the, keeping myself a strict vegetarian and finding myself becoming petty. Like one time uh, this monk, one of these monks obviously was aware of what I was doing, so when the vegetarian dish came in, he ran for it. <laughs> And, and he passed it out, and he gave me only a little bit. <laughs> and when I saw that, I was so angry that you'd be shocked at what I did. But I, <laughs> I took this very hot chili sauce, <laughs> and when I came to his bowl, I splattered it all over his food. <laughs> Revenge. Now this is obviously not practicing in the right way. <laughs> but then, because of the, the, the meditative life, one is at least becoming aware that this is not proper behavior. And, and so then I, after that I did that, it was like a culmination. Suddenly I realized how... how, how mean-hearted I was becoming through being a vegetarian. <laughs> so I, I decided to, uh, to, to just eat what, whatever came. And after that, I've made that more or less my, my rule of life, is to just eat whatever people give me and not, not make any comment on it. Uh, not, or, you know, just to watch the mind making comments, to use the situation for seeing that me and mine, I like this and I don't like that. And this is a very peaceful way to live because you, 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 if you really develop the practice in this way, then you, you wear out that kind of fussiness and picking and choosing and you, you become grateful. Like the ideal for a bhikkhu is, is to be grateful for what is offered. So we try to I tried to be that way, but then my ego would get in the way, and then somebody offered me something I didn't like. I would feel annoyed, but that annoyance was seen as a as an object, and more and more one would 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 refrain that that tendency to be annoyed would fall away, and then there was a real sense of gratitude, real uh, feeling of gratitude for what is offered and whatever it is. And because you're, you've no longer created a self around these, these things, the, the food you're eating, the robes you're wearing, the place you're living in, the people you're living with. So this is, say, with mindfulness and wisdom, we, we then learn how not to create problems around life the way it is. And then we can find a, a, a real inner peace and, uh, and a joyousness in our lives that we can't have if there's still selfishness operating in it. If we're still me first in anything, there, there's no possibility for joy in our lives. In living in a Buddhist country like Thailand, there's, there's a, it's a, it has a joyful quality to it. Uh, it people in Thailand uh, certainly are just like any other human beings, but they, they, do, uh, they do have a very generous nature. They love giving. And they, they really, they really the Thai hospitality is famous. If you, if you, they've, made, they've made millions these past few years through tourism, just because they, they know how to, uh, they, their hospitality is so... So people really like it, the sense of, of serving others, of being hospitable and generous. And in that there's, there's always a measure of joy. When you see, like at Amaravati, sometimes on a Sunday, you'll see uh, the Asians coming to give their food to the monks. They always have this joyful quality, a happiness to it. 
to the, to the, to the idea of giving. And then you see a lot of the Westerners coming uh, to, to tell me about all their problems. <laughs> 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 and uh, they don't have the joy. Um, <laughs> Uh, they, they, and then they tend to come to, in order to, to get something from the monastery. So in, over the years, we've been encouraging like the, the British, the European people that come there to, to also come and offer. And they, they find that a joyful experience. So joy is, is the result of generosity, of non-selfish giving. And a, a joyous life is when we, when we live for the welfare of others. Then we, then we feel a lot of joy. Uh, years ago when I went to India, I had an opportunity to visit uh, Mother Teresa in Calcutta. And that was at Christmas time in Calcutta. And she invited the Buddhist monks from the temple I was staying in over to help with this Christmas party for these orphans. Uh, and at that time, they, a lot of uh, they, uh, Calcutta was in a terrible state with all these refugees from Bangladesh war, and the streets were filled with refugees, people lying out on the pavements, and the railway station was solid human bodies. To, to take the train, you had to walk across people's bodies to get to the train. It's horrible. Never had to walk over anyone, uh, and, and then having to do that. I remember taking the train and having to walk over people's bodies was, was the most... I'll never forget it. It was... Uh, people were so desperate that that's the only shelter they could find. And so Mother Teresa with, with her nuns were, were helping to try to take in all these abandoned children. There were thousands of them. Because people couldn't afford to take care of their children anymore. So they either abandon them or give them to, to this orphanage. So one had to look at things that were really very disturbing. Say, if you walk through the streets of Calcutta, you'd see people dying on the street. And you'd, you'd see just the most wretched kind of human, human beings, you know, just nothing. Whole families, uh, destitute, out on the pavements, the grandparents and... <coughs> parents and children, all just living in rags out on the, on the pavements of the city. And it was, and it was quite cold then. There were the cold winds blowing. So they were covering themselves with rags and whatnot. So Mother Teresa, no doubt, had to look at some very depressing thing, because that is very depressing to see uh, such human misery. And yet the orphanage itself was a joyous place. There was, a, there was definitely a joyful atmosphere in the orphanage. And one felt it from Mother Teresa and the sisters because there was this giving. There wasn't me first. And even though they must have had to look at really horrible and depressing sights, they still had, they were giving themselves to others so that there was a, a joyousness in their lives. And yet, say, in West Sussex, which is a very wealthy area and the, these beautiful homes and gardens and thoroughbred horses and pedigree dogs and polo ponies and, and uh, people with, with uh, Rolls Royce, Mercedes Benz and, and uh, all the, the best that life has to offer and privilege, uh, 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 every type of privilege, yet you tend to see there's not very much joy in West Sussex. They worry about uh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they've got everything, you know, everything you could want is very clean and beautifully manicured lawns and lovely flower gardens and, and all the best holidays when they want, but it's all me first, isn't it? It's, it's my house and my things and they're afraid they're going to let these foreigners in and the, these people are going to lower their property values and, <laughs> and uh, 
I mean, they have so much already. One, when we uh, acquired, we acquired this property, uh, not only Chitterst House, which has 25 acres around it, but we had this forest of 108 acres. Then we also acquired this, the heart of this forest, which is a valley, a river, a, a stream that flows through this valley. That, uh, the, the forest is the forest around this valley. We eventually acquired the valley itself with a stream, goes into a pond, a beautiful waterfall, and then this uh, little cottage, Sussex Cottage, is where the, the nuns live. And I remember this, this pond used to be a fishing school. And uh, the man that lived in the cottage, he and his wife, they, were, uh, they really hated us when we moved into Chitter's house. And I remember feeling this scent when I'd walk uh, down that way. There was this stone bridge crossing over this stream. And, and this man, Mr. What was his name? Fothergill. Fothergill. He'd come out of his cottage and yell at me. And I felt like that child story of Billy Goat Gruff. <laughs> because <laughs> it seemed like he was one of that, that nasty Billy Goat coming out from under the bridge. <laughs> saying, Get out of there, you bum. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, he said he also had a shooting school in the forest. And he was very angry that we had this forest because he said, now, he said, uh, he said, the thing that really worries me about my school is, he says, now when I shoot my guns, he said, uh, I'm afraid that one of you might be around and I might hit you. And he said, then I'd really be in trouble. <laughs> and so the... the the uh, fishing school, people were resentful about us closing down the pond to, to, public, to fishing. And uh, one woman came to me and she said, oh, I've been fishing here for years. <laughs> and then, <laughs> now you've come and, and I can't do it anymore. It's the only piece I ever get. On Sunday mornings, I, I come here and I fish and I, and, uh, and I feel so peaceful. <laughs> and I said, uh, maybe you could do other things to find peace. <laughs> she didn't take me up on it. I was going to suggest meditation, but I realized that she wasn't quite open for that. But this is uh, in regards to, to the animal world and the, and the neighbors and the people around. It's, it's always too easy to put me first. So in, in, when we penetrate the I am and the me and mine with wisdom, then we turn the light on it and we see <clears throat> that that position is a painful one. It's suffering to be somebody who has to protect yourself and defend yourself all the time, and to to uh, have to think of yourself first is is a joyless realm, a dark realm of the mind, and it, and it is suffering. So when we turn on the light, then the self disappears. There's no self anymore. So there is the opportunities to serve others and to to to. It's not a kind of I'm going to put you first attitude. It's not me being patronizing and generous to you by putting you first, but the self actually dissolves. And then there, there's the way things are and the occasions, the uh, uh, joyful occasions to help and serve other beings and, and not to harm other beings. Like with the animal kingdom, not to harm other beings is, is peaceful. Not to harm things is very peaceful. <coughs> To, to, uh, to help others is joyful. So we experience peace through non-harming, through ahimsa, harmlessness. We feel peaceful and we feel joy through service and giving and generosity. So these are the, 
the ways of living life as a human being in which you fulfill yourself, and, and even though there's no self to fulfill. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you, you realize, that, and then life for us is dharma rather than self. We keep learning, we keep reflecting, we keep using the light to see the way it is, and more and more we understand there's a clearer and more profound understanding as life goes on. Now the different stages of, of realization, from stream entry to arahantship, these are, these are not to be regarded as personal attainments. Like oftentimes people ask, how many, are there any arahants, or has anyone attained sotapanna or stream entry? Or, uh, in Thailand there's a lot of this. People want to know if, who's who, who are the arahants, who are the stream enterers, who are the anakamis and the sakadakamis. These are the four levels of, of, uh, of understanding. To arahant is, uh, is perfect understanding. But we tend to think of these in the same way of we think of ourselves, as, as attainments or achievements. But these are stages for reflection, not for grasping. So stream entry, or in order to see the path clearly, uh, the first obstacle is, is the, what we call sakaya ditti, or selfishness, self-view. And then uh, doubt, self-view, doubt, and attachment to the forms, the rites, the rituals, the rules, the blind attachment to techniques and ideas and uh, fixed attitudes. Like for me, there is no problem with detaching from rituals because rituals to me were not, were never an attachment. I mean, like lighting candles and burning incense, and these things I did merely because you're supposed to. I didn't, never felt any attachment to it. But and sometimes we regard, you know, well, I'm certainly not attached to lighting the candles and burning the incense. In fact, we were asked not to burn the incense here, and I didn't mind at all not burning the incense. And so I'm obviously not attached. <laughs> so I must be a stream enterer. <laughs> 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 but the, uh, the what we call sila bhatta brahmasa or attachment to to rules to views to to uh, a techniques teachers all these things are a form of sila bhatta brahmasa. So this is an obstacle to seeing the path or the stream entry, the sotapanna. So the first one, of course, is I am the five khandhas. I am the body, I am the feelings, I am the perceptions, I am the volitions, I am the consciousness. The second is the doubt, not being sure, thinking about things, always ending up with, with doubt, hesitation, uncertainty, and then the, the attachment to our own techniques and, and attitudes and teachers, traditions, all of this become sila baramata through attachment. So it's not in saying, I don't need teachers and I don't need rules and I don't need traditions. It's not to, to uh, reject, but to understand and turn the light on to attachment. To see attachment, like doubt, is, is because you're attached to something, to an idea, to a, an ideal, or uh, something that you've heard, or something that somebody else has said. So doubt is, is always due to attachment. And the self, and sakaditi, or self-view, is due to attachment. So this clinging attachment is to turn the light on, it means to look at it. Not, you're not trying to pretend you're not attached, but you're really 
watching when when you're suffering and you you're obsessed or you're blinded by something then then you you reflect well what am i what is there is there attachment use the form is there there must be some kind of attachment for this to be this way so then you investigate you find out where there is attachment attachment to a teacher like if if uh, one time this this uh, american man came to a monastery ajahn chah's monastery and he 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 was a kind of know-it-all type of person so he was telling us all about you know how we should practice and he started criticizing our monastery which i could take but when he started criticizing my teacher luang pa cha i was i became really indignant <laughs> and i really let him know it <laughs> i say you better be careful he's an enlightened he's an arahant and you better not touch him no 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 so <laughs> so then then it became i saw while doing that that this was an unenlightened reaction and and i saw i was attached to uh, to ajahn chah because uh the attack because when there was any threat or criticism my reaction was to uh, destroy the person or or get even or what in with a person who's 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 questioning my idol my attachment so that didn't mean that i decided to leave ajahn chah but it mean i i i realized i there was no need to be attached so then that that's uh it's one one still uh, i lived with ajahn chah years after that but but more and more i i wasn't you know i could break through these i began to see my attachments and by seeing them one lets go it's through understanding and seeing things as they are that we can let go of them it's not through having an idea that we shouldn't be attached because that's another attachment but by understanding the nature of attachment then we we can see we can realize the way of letting go and non-attachment now using examples from my own life help you to to uh maybe see it's not sometimes a, somebody like myself comes in you 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 t- you can kind of think well uh ajahn sumedho never had the problems i've had because one doesn't realize like with ajahn chah i i you know the first few years i was in such awe that i tended to think that well he was you know he was tie and he never had all the problems and that i had so it's easy for him but then when you got to know him he went through very you know very difficult times and great uh, trials in his monastic life but the result of all that was a very happy and joyous human being and a wise teacher a compassionate teacher so in in your life i mean if this practice uh, we go through various we have to that's why in, i encourage you to reflect on the result so you learn from what you're doing you're not just conditioning yourself in by a technique or by what you think you should be or be doing you're actually learning how to see th- how to use wisdom you're turning on the light and seeing in the light more and more through reflecting on the way things are and what you what you reflect on is suffering and the the origin of suffering is through attachment so it's letting go of suffering the cessation of suffering we recognize when there's no suffering <coughs> realize no suffering when you when you're not suffering at all what is it like investigate your your mind and body when there's no suffering so you're aware of of non non suffering is conscious then rather than just suffering and happiness but non suffering is also 
very much what a lot of our life is with, without realizing it. Much of our life is, is neither, uh, is, is, is just non-suffering. It's just as is. But we, we don't notice it. We don't realize it, even though it's, it's here and now. We've never bothered to look and observe because of our obsessions of mind, views, and opinions that drive us always into more extreme conditions. So, realization, the end of suffering, non-suffering, and then the path, the right understanding, the seeing of the truth, and the, then the way, uh, the middle way, or the way of mindfulness, wisdom. So I offer this for your reflection for this evening.